Really um, wonderful to see so many of you here and, and uh, virtually. Thank you all so much for coming, taking the time to, to join us um, for this, uh, this great event, Lung Cancer Awareness Month event. Um, we have, I think, a really amazing uh, plan for the evening and hopefully we'll be able to educate you and enlighten you and we can have some really great discussion. We left lots of time at the end for questions. So, so really looking forward to the evening. Um, to introduce myself, I'm Sarah Goldberg. I'm a medical oncologist here. I'm one of the thoracic oncologists. Um, I'm also the research director for the Center for Thoracic Cancers. And um, let Dan introduce himself. Dan Boffa, I'm one of the thoracic surgeons uh, and I'm the clinical director for the uh, thoracic disease team. And thank you for coming. I, I've heard we have something like 10,000 people online. That may, be, that may be an estimate. There may be a couple of zeros off, but... Um, the the whole point of this is to to address questions and so that everybody feels they know more about lung cancer, lung cancer screening, how we're doing and where we're going than before you came here. And so there's no question that's too off base. I mean, this is probably the tenth time we've I've been a part of an event like this, and we've heard some really interesting questions. I don't think we've ever heard a really a bad question. There is no bad question. So, Please, um, if you're if you're at home, uh, chat in your questions through the chat function on uh, Zoom. Um, I'm going to be sitting in the corner here, uh, monitoring chat diligently. Um, but uh, after the speakers go, we'll open it up to questions. And if if something comes up during a a talk and you're like, I really need to know the answer to that, you can interrupt the speakers. It's okay. We're they're intentionally short talks. Um, and the people are used to being interrupted. So again, thank you uh, so much for coming. Okay, so I'm just going to give a, a very brief introduction to who we all are and what we're doing here today. Um, and then we're going to start with our, our speakers. Okay, so first who we are, we meaning we mostly in the front row here. So we are we have a, a, a lot of different uh, people and have they, who have different specialties and different interests and different roles in our team. Um, and I put in the middle of this this figure a, a center for thoracic cancers. That's kind of our umbrella term. But as you can see, there's so many different people that comprise our team. You've probably, if you're a patient here, if you're a family member of a patient here, you've probably met many of these people. We have. Dan and others, uh, thoracic surgeons, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, social workers, research staff, pathologists. I mean, so many different people comprise our team. Here's a, a picture from a couple of years ago now, um, which isn't even our full team. There's just so many people who, who kind of go into uh, this, this group that we call the Center for Thoracic Cancers. So where are we? We're really all over the state of Connecticut and also into Rhode Island. You can see all the stars that have all of our, our, cent our centers. Um, this is our kind of main hub in, in Smilo in New Haven, but so many different centers providing care um, for lung cancer and all different cancers all over the state and into Rhode Island. And so why are we here tonight? We mentioned this a little bit already. It's Lung Cancer Awareness Month. This is uh, uh, the ribbon that um, uh, deno uh, denotes uh, lung cancer awareness. So it's clear or white, I guess, is like the lung cancer color. I'm not sure who made that one up, but fine. Um, and I just wanted to show this. So when I was looking, I was trying to find some, some interesting things to show about Lung Cancer Awareness Month. And I, I found this online. This was posted just a few days ago, and it's a proclamation on National Lung Cancer Awareness Month this year. And I, it's probably maybe a little too small to, to read, so I'll just read it for you. It says, during National Lung Cancer Awareness Month, and this is from the White House, uh, we are inspired by the courage and fight of the millions of patients, survivors, caregivers, doctors, researchers, and advocates battling this terrible disease, the leading cause of cancer deaths in the United States. For the loved ones we have lost and all those we, we can save, we recommit to investing in cutting edge screening, prevention, and treatments, making them more affordable and effective and uniting this country in our movement to end cancer as we know it. So I thought really nicely said and really kind of highlights what we're doing this month, you know, thinking about lung cancer and, and here tonight. So here's the what's on the agenda for the evening. I you know, we, we put this together because we think it's some topics that are really important and exciting, and we hope you will think so too. First, we're going to hear from Lynn Tanui. She's a pulmonologist um, here at Yale. She's going to talk about the latest on lung cancer screening. Then we're going to hear about personalized lung cancer treatment. You could think about this in a lot of different ways. We'll hear from Gavit Woodard, who's a thoracic surgeon, from Tom Heyman, who's a radiation oncologist, from Soyeon Kim, a medical oncologist, so across the spectrum of care. Um, 
thinking about personalized lung cancer treatment. Then we're going to hear from Scott Gettinger, a medical oncologist, and Justin Blasberg, a thoracic surgeon, on how immune therapy has impacted lung cancer. And then last, um, Rick Wilson is going to tell us about new treatments on the horizon for lung cancer. So again, the talks will be fairly short, saving lots of time for questions. So think about your questions. If you're online, put them in the chat, and uh, we'll be happy to answer them either after e each talk or at the end, we'll have some time as well. We also have some amazing people in the audience, both in person, again, this like whole front area here are people as part of the lung team and also some people who are virtual. Here's a list of people that we have joining us so you know who's here and so you know who you can ask questions to. We have, I'll just kind of briefly go through to introduce them. Hallie Robinson, you probably, many of you know her, she's our social worker, she's here joining us. Sonia Dasik is a pathologist here. Lisa Fuchito, I think she's online. She's the director of the Tobacco Treatment Service. She also has some people from her team here. Andrew Danisopin is a thoracic surgeon. He's up here in the front. Uh, Vinny Mays is also a thoracic surgeon. Jennifer Posig is a pulmonologist joining us. Vita Geary, I believe, is online. She's the chief of clinical cancer genetics. So if you have questions about genetics of lung cancer, she's the person we can ask. Anna Bader is the, the, a radiologist specializing in, in thoracic radiology. Ann Chang is here towards the front here. Hi, Ann. A medical oncologist. And Roy Herbst, medical oncologist and chief of medical oncology. I believe he's joining us online as well. So really an amazing team. It's really fun to see all of you in person. I have to say we don't do this enough. Um, and uh, hopefully it will spark some great discussions. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Tanui, um, a pulmonologist we all look to to help us with our patients with lung cancer and other pulmonary diseases and an expert on lung cancer screening. So thank you so much, Lynn. No questions on chat so far. Okay. Chat's good. <laughs> Hello, everyone. It's really nice to see so many people here. Um, before I get started, I want to introduce uh, Polly Sather. Polly, if you just raise your hand, who's our nurse practitioner who runs the lung cancer screening program, and Krista Casey right next to her, who's our um, nurse who helps in the screening program and actually really facilitates our pulmonary part of the um, thoracic oncology program clinic. So I'm going to talk to you very briefly about lung cancer screening. Um, Sarah told me to just make three slides, and I did four, but everybody else looks like they did more, so <laughs> I can at least follow some instructions. So basically, um, cancer screening in general is done because it saves lives. And the purpose of any screening, whether it's blood pressure, <laughs> cancer, skin examinations, is really so that we can detect disease early before there are any symptoms and before it can cause harm. And in the case of cancer, we really want to detect cancer early before any symptoms occur because symptoms often unfortunately indicate that the cancer is starting to spread. So we really want to find it at a time when there are no symptoms that would alert anybody that there is a problem. And uh, Sarah already told you that lung cancer, well, the White House told us that uh, lung cancer is a leading cause of cancer death in the United States and actually in the world. And 150,000 Americans will die of lung cancer this year, 2022, and actually 1.8 million people in the world. And so this is a huge problem that I think has not gotten as much attention as it could have, perhaps because of the stigma of smoking. And yet a very large percentage of people who didn't smoke do get lung cancer as well. And we really need to destigmatize the cigarette piece of it because it's nobody's fault that they smoked and it's definitely nobody's fault that they get lung cancer. And so the really important news this dec the last decade, um, Scott Genninger, one of the medical oncologists, uh, the really important news about screening is that it can happen. And we've been waiting decades as lung doctors for screening to become in lung cancer, because screening has been an important part of um, identification of early stage breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer for a very long time. It's embedded into most medical practices. Um, and lung cancer was very late to this, um, uh, this sandbox essentially, because it, we were really looking at chest X-ray as a screening tool. And it turns out that's not good enough. And so there were huge studies done in the United States and elsewhere in the world showing that CT scanning is actually a very effective tool for lung cancer screening. And the ability to use that as a screening tool in healthy people really relates to the fact that the amount of radiation needed for a screening CT scan for lung cancer is really small. 
CT screening and CT scanning in general doesn't invoke a lot of radiation exposure, but lung cancer screening is very, very little. So that allowed us to use that tool for lung cancer screening. It turns out that it saves lives. And in 2013, the United States Preventive Services Task Force, which is the agency that informs Medicare on what Medicare should uh, pay for, approved lung cancer screening. And so we've really been trying to get the word out that screening for lung cancer is available. It should be done. It's really an easy test. A low dose CT takes less than five minutes. It's one breath through the scanner. It doesn't require anesthesia, doesn't require a blood draw. So compared to um, colonoscopy, for instance, it's a much, much uh, easier test and it's paid for now for people who qualify. Um, and so of the currently 14 to 15 million people in the US who qualify for lung cancer screening, less than 10% eligible are actually getting screened. And I think we really need to use opportunities like this to get the word out that you should be screened if you're at risk for lung cancer. It's a much easier test than many of the other lung cancer screening examinations. And, and we really have to do better at this if we're gonna impact those uh, numbers of people dying potentially unnecessarily from this disease. So that I just wanna show you what we look like compared to breast cancer, because the people who, have, who are doing screening in breast cancer now have been at it for decades. And the benefit from screening is really evident when you look at the breast cancer population. They have pink ribbons. I think you all know that. Um, and so if you look at this, this, this chart on the left side, the blue piece are the people who are diagnosed at stage one. This is like there's a small thing in the breast, often the woman is not even aware of that gets picked up on mammography. The green piece of this pie chart are people who are diagnosed at stage two, where maybe there is one lymph node involved, but it hasn't spread beyond that. And people who have more advanced disease are in the blue and purple pieces of this pie. And so you can see that the majority of people who are women who are diagnosed with breast cancer and a few men are diagnosed at early stage. And that has everything to do with screening mammography. And the really important message that is not on this slide is that those people in the blue, their five-year survival after diagnosis and treatment, and that's kind of a gold standard time point for cancers. If you get to five years, there's a really good chance you've had a cure, is 99%. So 99% of people who are diagnosed with breast cancer by mammography essentially are cured. That's unbelievable. And the five-year survival overall for the entire breast cancer population is more than 90% at five years. In contrast, that, that blue piece for lung cancer, the early stages is, is only about 20%. And then the people who have a small cancer and maybe one, one lymph node add a little bit more than that. So we're only diagnosing a quarter of people with lung cancer at that early stage where they're, the benefit from treatment is gonna be huge and their survival for long-term is gonna be much, much higher than unfortunately the majority of people in the purple and blue right now who are diagnosed at early stage. And my colleagues in medical oncology have come a huge long way treating patients with advanced disease. That's a whole different landscape that you're gonna hear about that has made phenomenal advances in, in the last really decade, 15 years. But it's this group that I think we could do this simple intervention for, where we could really change the landscape of lung cancer and make it turn into what breast cancer now um, is already achieving. And so the original recommendation for lung cancer was in 2013. And last March, that same group, the U USPSTF that advises the government on what should be covered, by insurance, expanded the recommendations for lung cancer screening to include adults ages 50 to 80 with a 20 pack year smoking history. And this, this um, actually they made it younger and less smoking and that expanded the population by twofold. So double the number of people now are eligible. And so if you have friends or family, or if you fit this, go get screened. It could really save your life. And one thing that's important to understand is that for lung cancer, the ability to personalize treatment now has really exploded and you'll hear about that. But it is also possible to personalize an assessment of an individual person's risk for lung cancer. And so people who come to our program to get screened, talk to Polly, 
or Krista to do a, a, a visit on the phone, essentially, to talk about the screen that's coming up, what to expect and what to expect afterwards in case there is an abnormality, because there's a lot of trepidation about undergoing any kind of screening examination, particularly if you're doing it for the first time. And what's important is that they go through an individualized risk prediction, because there are patients who are afraid that they have a risk for lung cancer and that fear is driving stress and anxiety. And we can do this with them and show them maybe that their risk is not so high and they don't have to be so worried and maybe they don't even need to be screened. But for patients where the risk is high based on their personal attributes, we really are going to try to get that patient to the screen because the benefit to them is going to be potentially enormous. So talk to your friends and family. You can save somebody's life by encouraging to go get screened. It doesn't hurt. There's no blood tests. There's, you just take a breath and zip through the scanner. And I'm making it sound much easier than is. You do have to get to the scanner in your car. Um, but it's really pretty simple once, you, once you're there. And I'll take any questions. I'm sorry, Vinny, do you want to um, come down and just talk about your veterans program? This is Dr. Vinny Mays, who is um, a thoracic surgeon in our group. Hello, thanks for the opportunity to talk. And for the for some of the patients that came down here and some of the patients on chat, uh, thank you for taking the time as well. And uh, congratulations, because in many ways you're a survivor of lung cancer. Um, just uh, to kind of um, lead off with what Dr. Tanui said, screening saves lives, um, specifically with regards to veterans and lung cancer. Um, there's about uh, 8,000 veterans that are diagnosed with lung cancer uh, annually every year. <clears throat> about 900,000 of those uh, veterans that are out there have an elevated risk compared to the normal population because of the exposures from either when they're deployed or from uh, you know, the bases uh, you know, around the United States. Um, and in fact, in the DOD's congressionally mandated research, it also shows that the five-year survival for veterans uh, is a little less than the general population. So we're trying to take a targeted um, uh, ability to kind of, you know, screen veterans uh, next Saturday, which is the day after Veterans Day on November 12th. From 9 to 12, uh, I'll be doing some screening with Megan Acarino at the Park Avenue Medical Center in Trumbull, where we'll be offering free screening as well as scans uh, for veterans. So if you are a veteran, uh, please, uh, there's flyers in the back that look like this. Um, or if you know a veteran, uh, you know, please grab one to have him or her uh, come out next Saturday. I'll be there to screen them. Thank you very much. I just, I, let me just add, yeah. just because this, this, I mean, it's, this is such a big deal that that if so, ten percent of people that are eligible for lung cancer screening are getting screened. Less than ten percent. For breast cancer, it's 76% of eligible people get screened. For colon cancer, it's 70%. If you just took that number up to 50%, you would save 20,000 lives. So if you're a church and you get 300 people screened for lung cancer, you're going to save one life. So there's toys for tots. There's all of these things. You know, what a great gift around the holidays. Just get people screened. It's it's a really big deal. And uh, if you take away one thing, and 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 so we're... We're doing a big campaign with the American College of Surgeons, and we're, we're making it really simple. If you're 50 or older and you smoked for 15 years or more, ask your doctor. So 50 and 15. So it's super easy to remember. 50 and 15, ask your doctor. Can I ask you a question? Sorry, don't go yet. I have a question for you. Well, what about people who um, maybe don't have that smoking history or who smoked like decades ago, but maybe they have a family history of, of smoking, you know, parent or, or sibling who, who had lung cancer, or maybe they, I don't know, had secondhand smoke exposure. How do you, how do you cancel those people? So it's, um, we use this kind of risk assessment and there are lots of these sorts of tools and models available for those patients who don't fit squarely into the, you know, the box of the USPSDF. Um, many of those people are worried and don't have as high a risk as they think they do. And so to some extent, this is to reassure them that they don't have to live in fear. Um, 
But I think if somebody is perceived by us as having big risk and they have a, a substantial risk, they really need to come in and, and really be evaluated. Whether or not that will lead to a screen or a CT or just a medical assessment at that point can be decided based on that person's individual situation. Yeah, and you have to come up because online they won't hear you unless you come up. Thanks so much. I just have a question I get from my patients a lot. That is, um, you know, what's the radiation exposure and and uh, because people are are concerned about that. So. As I think I said, the radiation exposure from a low dose screening CT scan is really low. Um, and when I say really low, I'm going to compare that to like ambient radiation. So just living on earth, you, we get radiation every day. We get less in Connecticut than if we were in Denver or living at the top of the Andes, the closer you are to the sun, the more radiation there is. Um, so how many people in here flew in an airplane in the last three years? Right. And so you were actually much closer to the sun. And we don't think about that radiation, but it's kind of on that scale, you know, a few airplane flights worth. I this has been looked at because certainly we as a medical community were really concerned about the radiation exposure. And for I think every 10 to 100,000 screens, there's enough radiation collectively that you might worry about one lung cancer. And so you have to think about the benefit to the population is quite sizable. And then there's one, there's one issue with one patient in that many thousands. And we certainly have to accept risks of all medical interventions and radiation is one, but the um, amount of radiation that has been given for these scans is so low and it gets lower every year. So from the time that we started screening back actually in 2011, 12 to now, we know because we measure this in our scanners that the amount of radiation has gone down like to such small doses that the old predictions of what's the harm probably should all be redone again because the risks will be much lower. We do have a chat question for our radiologist, uh, Anna. Um, how do you know, uh, so Anna is our chief of thoracic imaging and um, uh, Anna, there is a, a question, when do you give contrast? So if you if you want to add to anything that uh, Dr. Tanui said about the radiation, um, or how do you know when it's time to give IV contrast? Hi, excellent question. Thank you. Um, so in lung cancer screening, we in, uh, for a screening CT, we never give contrast. Um, so Usually in the, for chest imaging, we give contrast if we have a specific question that would better be evaluated. Uh, by opacifying the vasculature better. So I would say we probably, in all of chest imaging, we probably give contrast less than half the time. And for lung cancer screening, never. And just to uh, support uh, Dr. Tanui's uh, statements about uh, the radiation dose, absolutely the dose has gotten uh, much lower even since we started um, since we started uh, screening for lung cancer. And uh, many of the estimates are in terms of risk of radiation are, are quite outdated at this time. And so just for example, we get a, a lung cancer screening CT is less than the amount of radiation that we get just by living on earth, like in Connecticut for about three to four months. So it's, it's less than the radiation we get in a year. Um, and it's about 10 transatlantic flights. So not local flights, but long distance, high up in the atmosphere for many, many hours. Okay. All right. Oh, great. Yes, you could say your question from there and I'll repeat it for the online people. Go ahead. Great. So I'm just repeat the question. So the question, because I want to make sure I understand this, does your risk change over time, your personal risk, or do these models change over time? Okay. 
so that these models were actually developed in really big populations that were being monitored over time. So they do, this one happens to be for lung cancer risk assessment some for screening purposes. But um, there are models that look at people who never smoked, you know. And so it not every patient variable is on there, which is why I think if there's a question about personal risk, you should go in and get seen so that you can have that discussion with somebody who knows, you know, what they're talking about. Um, I, I want to just bring up something you said. I was found by accident. So we shouldn't depend on accidents. So you were, I hope, lucky that you know something was found because you had an x-ray done for a completely other reason. And up until screening started, that was the only way we found these early lung cancers is by serendipity. Somebody was lucky enough to be unlucky enough to have a scan. And then they were found to have a spot. And so then, then they got seen. And, and it's terrible to be waiting for somebody to stumble into a chest X-ray or a CT scan. It should be part of our routine so that we routinely find lung cancers that are early, not wait for an accident. So thank you for bringing that up. I just have a question. A lot of the screening is based on demographics. Has there ever been consideration based on a profession? like a construction worker who's been exposed to asbestos, or a veteran who's been deployed, a uh, firefighter exposed to smoke, yeah. a chef exposed to cooking oil. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> so that it's hard to quantify that risk because they're not populations of people who, who are being studied longitudinally that way. But, but it is definitely the case that there are occupations with carcinogenic exposure. The reason cigarettes are a problem is they have tons of carcinogens, cancer-causing chemicals in them. And so firefighters are exposed to um, particulates that often carcinogens in the air will adhere to or to diesel or, or things that by themselves have little risk for lung cancer, but it's a cumulative process. And we know that lung cancer, like melanoma, you know, cancer of the skin, is a cumulative genetic alteration kind of malignancy in many cases, not all, but many. And so the best model would have all of those things in them. And the challenge is that we don't have um, the ability to gather a population of thousands and millions of people and follow it, follow that population forever. Having said that, this is not the end. And so screening eventually really is going to involve much more than demographics. How old are you? How much did you smoke? What did you do for your job? How much education? And so on and so on. It will include blood markers, for instance. And so we should at some point in the not too distant future be able to add that. And the best model would really include factors of the patient that they can tell us, that we can know because we've read their history, and factors related to their, you know, their makeup of proteins and genetics and their metabolism. And we're not so far from that. It's like right over the horizon. So I think hopefully within not months, but years, we will see that added to this um, to screen in terms of assessing risk of then a broader population than just smokers. I'm gonna ask one more question in part to you, but also I think Dr. Geary is here to talk to us about genetics. Hi, can I ask you a question now that related to this topic? So um, there, there are some, um, genetic mutations that people can have that put them at risk for certain cancers. And I wonder if um, that's, you know, if, if someone has one of those mutations or, or if there's a, there's certain um, characteristics uh, in, in, in family history or, or mutations that, that might make someone need to be screened more often or how you think about that. And then Lynn, if you wanted to comment as well, do you want to come up here and, and tell us? Yeah. Thank you so much. Gosh, yeah, nice to be here. So uh, it's great to be here. Thank you so much. Great presentation. And um, yeah, that's a really good question. And um, as far as lung cancer genetic testing goes, it's um, it's an evolving field, but um, there is a known recognition of um, hereditary familial lung cancer. 
And so um, some of those features would be, um, of course, you know, recognizing that there were um, blood relatives that had lung cancer. So oftentimes we look at the closeness of those relationships. So for example, um, siblings, parents would be considered some of the closest blood relatives. And then even expanded blood relatives, so uncles, aunts, grandparents. So looking at the full family history can become really important when thinking about, is there a suspicion for hereditary um, risk for lung cancer in a family? That always has to be factored in with the fact of all of the other kinds of questions that are always asked, you know, was there smoking and, and et cetera, et cetera. But family history itself becomes really important. Um, other things that become important were the age of diagnosis of lung cancer. So typically for hereditary syndromes, the younger the age of diagnosis, the greater the suspicion that it's linked with a genetic mutation that could have been inherited. So ascertaining the age of diagnosis for lung cancer is also really important. Um, and I say this is an evolving field because um, there are a few genes that have been um, reported and published about contributing to inherited um, lung cancer. And there's three that are typically more cited in the literature. So um, ERB2, EGFR, um, YAP1. These are some of the ones that are um, reported and sort of verified as far as uh, contributing to inherited lung cancer. Um, you know, that's opposed to a lot of other cancers that we can do genetic testing for, where there's many, many more genes, you know, and so this is a, an active area of discovery of research to try to find many other genes. Um, and they can be tested for, um, and oftentimes, you know, will insurance cover it? These questions have to be um, discussed with patients if they're interested in genetic testing. Um, typically, out-of-pocket costs have come down significantly. So where it used to be in the thousands, we can do genetic testing now for about $250 out-of-pocket. So still expensive, but it's, it's become more doable. Um, and then what to do with that information is the next step, you know, in terms of do we do the uh, low dose CT screening, you know, going forward? What are we looking for? There's a lot more to be learned because lung cancer is al also has different types of um, features, like different pathologies, as they're called. So some of these genes might be linked with certain pathologic subtypes. So we're learning a lot more. There are a few genes that are available for testing. I think looking at the family history and thinking about who had lung cancer, what ages were the diagnosis, was there smoking, really helps to kind of bring that to the forefront. At the end of the day, I think if there's any question, it would be really helpful to see a genetic specialist, um, a genetic counselor to have a discussion about that. All right, amazing discussion. I think we're gonna move on as we have a lot of other amazing topics to talk about. Thank you all so much. Thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Shinui. Um, all right, so we're gonna talk next about personalized lung cancer treatment. Hopefully at the end of this discussion, you'll understand what we mean by this. And first we have Gavit Woodard, thoracic surgeon coming to talk to us. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And thanks for everyone for being here today. I wanted to call out in the audience, our surgical APP team. Could you guys wave? Um, if you end up having surgery for lung cancer, they are a critical part of your care, both in clinic and in the hospital. And so we really appreciate them being here. And thanks to all the patients who are here as well. Um, so we personalize every patient's approach to treatment, and that's really important, and that's a reason why it's great to come to a cancer center like Smilo, where you're going to get the top-of-the-line care for surgery, radiation, and oncology. These are our three main kind of weapons that we have when we have a patient who's been diagnosed with lung cancer, and we combine them in different ways depending on the stage of your cancer. We typically think of surgery and radiation as being a good way to treat local disease. So if you have early stage cancer, cancer within one part of your chest, those are the tumors where we think that surgery is a good tool or that radiation is a good tool because they're a very focal approach. And we're really only treating what we're either taking out with surgery or targeting with our radiation. For patients that have potentially more widespread or systemic disease, this is where the oncologists come in with systemic therapy, and there are a lot of different options for that. Chemotherapy is one that's kind of the classic cytotoxic, lose your hair sort of therapy that people think of, 
But now in lung cancer, we have so many other really exciting options for treatment. And these have all been breakthroughs in the past decade or so. And it's really changed what treatments we have available. So I'll let our oncologists get more into those. But we have targeted therapy, which goes after a specific mutation within a tumor, and then immunotherapy, which gets at you know how getting our body's own immune system to fight off a tumor. So how do we personalize your treatment? A lot of this comes down to stage and what stage you might have kind of determines the main ways that we would approach your treatment. So for stage one disease, we're thinking of these local therapies, either surgery or radiation treatment. When you start to have stage two disease, maybe you have a local lymph node within the lung that's found to have cancer in it. We start thinking about combining local therapy to address the primary tumor itself and maybe lymph nodes in that area and possibly tying in some of our systemic options, which might be used to mop up any cancer cells that may have spread outside of our field. Stage three disease, we start to focus a little bit more heavily on the systemic therapies, just because we know that these patients are more likely to have cells that have spread kind of outside of their main chest cavity. And then for stage four, we primarily rely on these systemic therapies, the chemotherapy, targeted therapy, and immunotherapy. How we make these decisions about what is the best option for you, obviously patient preference plays a big role. I, I'm a surgeon, so I love to operate on people, but if I'm seeing someone in clinic who says, there's no way I'm having surgery, they're obviously not gonna make it into the OR. And so we like to hear from you about your preferences for your own treatment, and then use our medical knowledge to help guide you to make what is the best informed decision that you can about your care. Um, when we're thinking about certain therapies versus others, we do take into account other medical conditions that you have. And a lot of our more complex cases are presented at Tumor Board, where we all get to meet now over Zoom once a week. And we talk about anybody that's outside of really a run of the mill sort of case. We discuss a lot of cases just to get input from each other. We all get along very well and are used to collaborating on patient care. To focus on surgery, um, generally this is being used for stage one to three tumors. So there are exceptions to these rules, but generally it's the more early stage disease. Frequently our operations these days are minimally invasive and robotic. So it's no longer the big rusty chainsaw incision on the side. We use small ports, small incisions, and this is used for the vast majority of our cases. Um, and obviously these decisions are made when we look at your scans and talk to you in clinic. Um, if it is a minimally invasive operation, patients are typically in the hospital for about one to three days. They go home fairly quickly. The recovery is quick. It still is surgery. I don't want to undersell it, but people do quite well. And most people are off of most painkillers when I see them in clinic about two weeks later. During surgery, what's unique to that is that we are physically removing the tumor itself and any draining lymph nodes from your body. We get a section of healthy lung around it. The point of these margins of healthy lung is to catch any cells that are potentially in transit that we can't see with our CT scans. So it has the benefit of potentially catching cells that might be spreading other places. And that's why we think of surgery as primarily being the best treatment you can have if you just have a disease in one spot in your lung. From our surgical specimens, they all go to pathology where they're evaluated. We then will give you staging information. For patients that don't have surgery, we stage their cancers based on imaging and sometimes invasive biopsies, but we think of the pathologic stage from surgery as really being our best way that we can accurately stage your cancer. The other thing that's really useful about surgery is that we get you know, the cancer out and we have large chunks of tissue that can be used to do all sorts of studies that get at what mutations your tumor might have, special stains for matching you with certain therapies. And often tissue like this is needed to participate in clinical trials. We also run a lot of research studies here at Yale. And if your tissue is not being used for your clinical care, this tissue can also help a lot of our cancer researchers do lung cancer work, which is important. 
Uh, like I said, it's considered kind of our best form of local treatment. How we personalize this, you'll meet with a surgeon in clinic. They'll go through your medical records, talk to you about your history, and very importantly, review your CT scans, which give us a sense for what anatomy is and whether or not we think that you would tolerate the lung cancer surgery that would be needed to treat you. We use small incisions and do this minimally invasively with cameras whenever possible. Um, for patients who do have much larger tumors or a tumor that's close to vessels or very centrally located, we often find that these are still best approached with a thoracotomy, which is an incision on the side. We'll talk to you about what we think is the best approach in your specific situation. And then we have a really collaborative environment, more complex cases are discussed at our weekly surgeon kind of only group meeting. And, um, and then we also talk about cases at tumor board and any really complex case, you'll probably have more than one attending surgeon um, doing the case at that time. Um, some of these questions, what does healthy enough for surgery mean? Uh, you know, we want to make sure you're not bed bound, uh, really struggling with other medical comorbidities that would make it unreasonable to operate on you. Um, make sure that your heart is healthy enough to have the anesthesia required for lung surgery. So we typically get a cardiac evaluation. We can do a perfect operation, but if it, if you have a heart attack as part of that, we haven't done you very much good. Um, and then lung function test. And these tests, also called pulmonary function tests, PFTs, give us a sense for how much lung can be safely removed. Who can have minimally invasive or robotic surgery? Smaller tumors typically are removed robotically and peripheral. So if it's a central or larger tumor, these tend to be done open. These are some pictures of uh, the da Vinci robot that's used in a lot of our cases. And then finally, um, we are now in this big new era of combining newer therapies before surgery. And this is a, a hot topic for discussion among physicians as well as patients. Um, as a general rule, you know, we tend to give therapies up front or before surgery. If you are slightly more advanced stage, there are lymph nodes involved. And we think that giving you these therapies in advance might help us, you know, have an easier time in the operating room. And there's been a lot of new data coming out that giving these therapies before surgery can help improve your survival long-term. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my radiation colleagues, but thank you and happy to answer any questions at the end. You all know this is a two-day event, right? <laughs> <laughs> when does it become a hostage situation? <laughs> Um, thanks so much for the invitation to talk, and thank you for everyone uh, joining us today. So I'm Tom Heyman. I'm one of the radiation oncologists here at Yale. Um, and just wanted to first briefly just discuss radiation, uh, specifically here at Yale Cancer Center and Smilo and how, how things have evolved and, and how we can personalize uh, patients' radiation therapy. Um, so when we think about radiation therapy from a, from a radiation oncologist perspective, we're, we're thinking about primarily two, uh, two approaches. And um, this is brachytherapy and external beam radiation therapy. And primarily in the context of lung cancer, uh, we are thinking about external beam radiation. This is radiation that's delivered from the outside using machines called linear accelerators. Uh, and this is really used for patients um, with all stages of lung cancer. This, so this is from our very early stage lung cancer patients with stage one uh, disease, all the way up to our patients who have more widespread metastatic disease, uh, where we're attempting to help uh, control symptoms. Um, and from an um, evolution of radiation perspective, things have come a long way. And you're going to hear, uh, you've heard about that in the context of surgery and minimally invasive surgery. You'll hear about this in the context of uh, evolving systemic therapies. This is uh, radiation is, um, uh, uh, is, this has also been the case for radiation therapy, right? So um, even 10 or 15 years ago, when we talked about radiation, we were talking about radiation that was delivered with one or two beams of radiation coming in from the front or the back and maybe the side. Uh, and this is called 2D or three-dimensional radiation therapy. Um, and, and this really, um, while effective, um, did uh, expose a lot of normal tissue uh, to radiation dose that didn't need to happen. And so with the advent of um, IMRT or intensity modulated radiation therapy, we're now able to deliver very high doses of radiation, uh, primarily to the tumor and minimize radiation to, to the normal tissue, so the heart the healthy lung, the esophagus, all the things that cause um, patients' side effects uh, from our treatment. 
And so this really is the standard of care for patients, uh, particularly with early stage and, and uh, curable lung cancer. Um, uh, and, and this is um, sort of a more advanced version of this is what we call SBRT or stereotac stereotactic body radiotherapy. And this is very high dose uh, focused radiation that's delivered primarily for early stage lung cancers. Uh, and I have up here proton therapy. This is an area of active uh, research uh, in the radiation oncology community. Um, where we're evaluating whether this is something that, uh, that has a place in lung cancer therapy, but it's not really at the, the forefront of, of standard of care at this point. So how do we personalize radiation therapy for, uh, for our patients here at SMILO? Uh, and as you've heard, and I'll, and I'll echo this sentiment, uh, everything really starts with a multidisciplinary evaluation um, uh, for our patients. So this is, again, evaluation um, in collaboration with pulmonologists, thoracic surgeons, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists. Uh, because input from all of these different physicians really helps to, to define the treatment that's going to um, offer the best chance of cure and, uh, and really minimize uh, treatment morbidity or side effects for our patients, right? And so uh, as Dr. Woodard was mentioning, for early stage uh, patients uh, in the context of, um, of radiation therapy uh, or, or local therapy, we're thinking about surgery versus radiation. Uh, in terms of radiation therapy, we have a number of different uh, uh, tools that we can utilize. And, and some of these are things like SBRT, which is high dose focal radiation that's delivered in between one to five uh, outpatient treatments. Um, depending upon anatomic location, prior radiation therapy, prior surgery, um, we do have to uh, sometimes adjust the radiation plan uh, to involve more protracted type radiation regimens where we're now delivering radiation over several weeks. Um, and, and that's again, a decision that's made at the time of consultation with our, uh, with radiation oncology. Um, and so this is just an, an example of that, where this is a patient who's received three different courses of radiotherapy, uh, SBRT for three different early stage lung cancers. Uh, now, as we move into the more advanced disease setting, so we're talking about patients with now stage uh, two through four therapy, we're now beginning to integrate um, our radiation therapy with systemic therapies. And this is in, again, done in collaboration with our medical oncologists. Um, we're looking at other medical conditions and how we may um, choose our radiation dosing regimens based upon uh, integration with those other therapies. From a, a purely um, technical perspective and uh, radiation perspective, every patient that comes into our, uh, or is being treated with radiation uh, has a customized radiation plan that's developed for them, right? This starts with custom immobilization that's done when they're, when they're um, radiation planning scans are done. Uh, we're doing things, uh, four-dimensional CAT scans, where we're able to visualize uh, every patient's tumor uh, move as they breathe. Uh, and then once we um, begin the planning process, we involve a, a team of uh, physicians, physicists, and dosimetrists to develop a, a customized radiation plan for that patient uh, to really maximize our chance of cure uh, and to minimize treatment side effects. And then lastly, um, another benefit of being at a, an academic institution such as uh, Yale Cancer Center is that all of our uh, radiation plans uh, for our patients being treated with lung cancer are reviewed by a team of uh, Yale Lung Cancer Specialist Radiation Oncologists uh, for both quality and safety. And so uh, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over. Let me, let me just ask a couple of questions sure. to uh, you and Gavit just from the uh, chat. So the local therapies are the more dangerous, obviously. So um, Andrew done a soap on one of our thoracic surgeons. Um, I've heard you operate on people that were told that they were inoperable. How, how could that be? Like, how do you decide who is operable and how is it that one surgeon says they're inoperable and another surgeon says they're operable. How do you, how do you make that decision? And Tom, same with you, you know, I've, I've had patients that you were able to treat that weren't. Uh, and so how is that determined? Yeah. Uh, so like Dr. Woodard mentioned, um, when we, uh, meet with you in clinic, uh, we go over, uh, the details of, um, the pulmonary function tests, uh, cardiac testing and the other, uh, comorbidities. Um, in addition to the staging. Uh, so we take all that into consideration when we um, say that uh, this cancer is operable. Um, sometimes it does come down to some uh, gray areas and some uh, judgment calls. Um, and I think the advantage that you have here um, at our uh, cancer center is that 
Um, we do have the experience to do more uh, advanced um, cancers, uh, more complex operation on, on these advanced cancers and um, uh, patients with um, uh, who aren't the healthiest either. Um, and, you know, that's really a testament to uh, the staff that we have in the operating room, uh, the staff that we have, um, uh, uh, as um, uh, Dr. Woodard had uh, pointed out, our APPs, um, uh, taking care of you post-op uh, and on the surgical floor, the nursing staff, everybody um, contributes to uh, getting you through um, your operation. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll echo a lot of that, um, that sentiment in that, um, you know, again, a lot of this starts from collaboration with our, with our colleagues and other disciplines, right? So if I have concerns about patients in terms of their ability to tolerate, um, for instance, SBRT or, or um, more broad um, conventionally fractionated radiation. Um, one of the benefits of being at SMILO is being able to reach out to um, our pulmonology colleagues or um, our other colleagues who are really able to help us um, assess risk of, uh, of our treatment to, to our patients. And this is a benefit of, of being here at Yale. Um, Additionally, from a radiation oncology perspective, uh, another benefit that I alluded to earlier is that, um, you know, I'm one of uh, several radiation oncologists who, who uh, primarily treat lung cancer patients. Uh, and so having that expertise available uh, to discuss uh, amongst ourselves for, for our treatment of patients really does help us to, to push the envelope and have a little more uh, experience and expertise in terms of uh, coming up with treatment plans for our patients. One of my favorite quotes is from Henry Ford, who says, whether you think it can be done or it can't, you're probably right. And I, I do think that, you know, there, and it's not just Yale, this isn't a sale pitch for us. I think big hospital versus small hospital, if, if you're told you're not operable um, and it hasn't spread, I do think that's a good indication to get a second opinion. And it's the same thing with radiation. I think if you're told, if it's one thing, if, if local therapy doesn't make sense because of where the disease is, you know, uh, then that's one thing. But if, if they, if it's a safety thing or just a technical complexity thing, I would personally, or have somebody that I cared about have a consultation at another, at a bigger hospital. Any other questions? All right. Chat, anybody? All right, seeing them. Oh, hi everyone. Um, I'm Soyan. Um, I'm one of the new medical oncologists that just freshly graduated and just started um, this year at Yale. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit about um, targeted treatment and what that means. So lung cancer is no longer one disease and um, just wanna take you back to the 1960s and give you a little bit of a history. Um, so back in 1960s, if you were to present to a doctor with lung cancer, we had two different flavors, kind of like how we have two flavors for ice cream, vanilla chocolate. Um, so there was small cell lung cancer and non-small cell lung cancer. And the distinguishment was based on how they looked under the microscope. So small cell lung cancer, they look like oats, like in the oatmeal in the breakfast. Um, and non-small cell lung cancer was more of a glandular subtype. And um, the treatment was chemotherapy. Um, and now moving on towards the millennium, in 2004, um, we have discovered new subtypes of lung cancer um, within the non-small cell lung cancer subtype, which makes up more about 85% um, of the lung cancer types. Um, there were what's called driver alterations um, that have been discovered. And I guess to give a better idea of what a driver alteration is, is um, I guess if you think about driving in a car, you're on I-95, um, you're speeding 75 miles per hour, and you're trying to get to North Haven to see Dr. Sarah Goldberg. Uh, so you have to take an exit on exit 10. Um, to get to North Haven a Clinic, and you have to press on the brake, right, to swerve into the right exit, um, but on the your foot's stuck on the accelerator, so you can't get to the brake, and you're just accelerating and accelerating, and this is kind of what a um, driver alteration does, in which um, the tumor cell continues to grow based on these growth signals. Now, they're necessary for normal cell growth, but if it's too much, then that will lead to tumor growth. And um, we've discovered a number of um, driver alterations. Um, so KRAS, um, BRAF, HER2, um, and the pieces of this uh, 
pie gets smaller and smaller. And now this is 2022, where we have a number of different driver alterations that's driving the cancer. And um, I think one person from the audience mentioned that they were a never smoker um, and they were diagnosed with lung cancer. Um, if people don't mind, I just wanted to see, um, would anyone be able to raise their hands on who were diagnosed with lung cancer who are not smokers? Just out of curiosity. Wow. So there's a quite a handful. Um, so a lot of these driver alterations are present in patients who have been um, non-smokers. And we've kind of, you know, um, through advances in research, trying to think about what treatment options are best um, for these targeted mutations. So now that we know um, that there are different driver alterations that are driving these cancers, how do we change the focus um, of targeted therapy? So before we were maybe blindfolded on what would be causing these um, tumors to grow. And now we're trying to find more targeted options. So I wanted to share with you um, a patient I saw during fellowship before I started my job um, here at Yale. And this is a patient, she was in her forties. Um, she was a school teacher. She was a non-smoker, like a lot of you guys. Um, and she presented with shortness of breath, went to the emergency room. Um, she had a CAT scan because everybody was worried about potentially a lung clot. Um, and when they did a CAT scan, they found that she had um, not a blood clot in the lungs, but she had a spot in her left lung. Um, and also spots in the lymph nodes. Um, and she had a couple other spots in her bones as well. And um, some blood testing was sent to look for these mutations. And her blood testing came back positive for a ROS1 fusion. So there was a targeted treatment for this ROS1 fusion called entrectinib, and she was starting on entrectinib. And this is her scan three months later. So this is a PET scan. And um, you see that the parts of the scan where it's not lighting up like a Christmas tree. Um, so you see that she has responded to this treatment and um, she had a pretty good response where a lot of the tumor that we've seen in the scan has pretty much dissolved and disappeared. So this is one of the success stories, I think, of using targeted treatment options. And there have been a number of different um, targeted treatments that have been approved by the FDA or are under accelerated approval. Um, some of them being osimertinib for EGFR mutations, kapmatinib for MET mutations, electinib and HER2, sotorecib, obacertinib, and there's a lot more. Okay. So we did well, um, and how do we do better? And um, I just wanted to share with you some of the research that's being done here at Yale. Um, it's called a lung master protocol, or in short, lung map. And this is a clinical trial that's been pioneered here at Yale under um, Dr. Roy Herbst, and also um, in collaboration with the um, Southwestern Oncology Group called SWOG, and a number of other, other institutions in which um, patients are screened for these mutations um, in their tumors. And they try to match um, basically treatments targeting these um, tumor mutations. And um, this was opened in 2014, and uh, the, in 2019, it's been expanded to include other subtypes of lung cancer. And so far, um, about more than 4,000 patients have been screened, um, and they all have uh, mutational profiling. So I think, um, you know, from a medical oncologist perspective, we see a lot of patients with advanced lung cancer. And I think that the take-home message is that, um, you know, we're all hoping that one day we can just take the tumor, um, send it for mutational profiling, um, and then give you guys more of a unique um, treatment that's specific for um, the patient that we're seeing in clinic. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions about target treatment. Be either. Um, you have some chat questions in the chat. Okay, I, I see um, Dr. Roy Herbst on, uh, online here. Roy, are you available to take questions? You're muted though. Absolutely, hello everyone. Hello, I wonder if they can see you somewhere. I don't think they can see you. I could see you though, hello. He's very handsome. Uh, I know, <laughs> it's this big. They can, can you all hear him? Okay, they can hear you. So, Dr. Harps, Soyan, just um, Dr. Kim just showed it, or maybe you can see the slide is showing the the slide of lung map. I was wondering if you wanted to make a comment of of how this study has gone, what we've learned from it, and kind of where it's going, because it really is 
as just as she said, uh, you know, we've done so well with targeted therapies, but how are we going to advance things further? And I think this is one of the ways. So, wanted to see if you wanted to comment on that. Right. Well, it's great to see everyone. I'm Roy Herbst. I'm actually the deputy director at the center right now, and um, I work in lung cancer for many years. This trial has been open uh, now almost eight years at, at Yale, and uh, we've many of some of you may have been on it. The idea here is to get drugs to patients where they live. Um, you can get this trial at any of our sites um, here in Connecticut, but it's also open at about 700 sites around the country. And what we're trying to do is find, as you hear, we're talking about precision medicine. So for precision medicine, we have to find the cancer and find the abnormality in that cancer and match it to the right drug at the right time. The problem is some of these abnormalities are only present in two to 3% of people, 4%. It seems quite small. However, if you've got an umbrella of a trial where you have drugs for these different abnormalities, you can funnel patients in from around the country. So if, if you get your, your cancer profile here at Yale, we send it to a central facility and then we can match you with the, with the right drugs. We've learned a lot from this trial. Some of the drugs have worked, some have not, um, but it's, um, it's, uh, we just had a very nice uh, result where two drugs, uh, one drug's called pembrolizumab, some of you might know it as Keytruda, uh, when Contruda was um, was added to uh, uh, a, a, an antibody, a drug that blocks growth factors, it actually worked in people who had failed the Contruda. So um, we're continuing to have studies like this, and we can talk more in the questions later, but we have studies like this. And this is why when you come to the, the center like ours, we can we can try to find something not the standard of care, but what will hopefully be the standard of care in the future. That's where clinical trials are so important under very safe uh, guidance. So thanks for calling on me, Sarah. I'll stay here for the rest of the meeting. Great. Thank you so much. Go ahead. So uh, Justin, one of, the, uh, one of the virtual attendees had surgery in 2017 and um, is, is still alive, obviously, but has a lot of symptoms and has a lot of difficulties. And how are you balancing quality of life with quantity of life when you're talking about surgery and talking about multiple modalities of treatment? How are you thinking about it? Come on down, Justin. Um, how do you think about it? How do you, how do you, uh, how does that become a part of your decision making? And, and is there anything new that's helping you uh, preserve quality of life? Hi guys, Justin Blasberg. Um, Dan, thanks for that question or the uh, the person who asked it. Um, so I think quality of life is an important part of what we talk about when we discuss surgery, when we talk about the, um, you know, the potential challenges of surgery, the short-term uh, expectations of surgery as it relates to recovery and how that impacts quality of life. Um, that then naturally becomes a, a, a conversation about long-term quality of life. And so I think we stick to a lot of... Um, the tenants that we've sort of discussed earlier uh, in Gavitt's talk, um, we focus a lot on risk stratification, making sure that patients are appropriate for the type of procedure, the type of treatment that we're thinking about offering. Minimally invasive surgery is a big part of how we improve quality of life in, in, on the surgery side in terms of getting patients back to um, you know, their, their baseline functional status, how they feel before surgery is how we want them to feel after surgery. And sometimes that takes time and everyone's a little bit different. So uh, we focus on uh, understanding where they are before they started surgery and then working towards getting them back to where they were uh, after surgery. Some patients, that's a couple of weeks. Some patients that takes longer. It depends on what kind of surgery is required. It depends on um, you know what, what the post-operative period is like, but we really focus on, on um, hitting all those milestones after surgery, making sure the patients are getting out of the hospital in a timely and safe way and then working towards reestablishing that baseline uh, quality of life so that we can move on to some of these other opportunities like surgery, like uh, chemotherapy or radiation, or even just surveillance, which is a big part of what we do. Maybe we'll, just, Jennifer, maybe we'll have Dr. Pasek come up as well and, and help us with that type of question as well, because as a pulmonologist, I'm sure you see a lot of people after surgery who have symptoms or after some of our other treatments, radiation. So tell us your perspective on Sure. Hi, I'm Jennifer Posick. I'm a pulmonologist in the group. Um, I think that it's an excellent question. Um, and one thing to consider is that uh, each 
patients' experiences, individual recovery and survivorship isn't linear. And lung cancer doesn't exist in isolation. It's just one facet of a person's life, right? They have different medical conditions. They have different demands on their time. Different acute illnesses may arise. Um, and all the pre-planning we do as a multidisciplinary team is aimed at trying to come up with the safest plan and to implement it safely. Um, but in the post-operative period, that multidisciplinary team is there too. And so part of it is aimed at managing any immediate complications that arise. Some of it is aimed at managing people's other pulmonary conditions, which can be an important feature um, for patients with lung cancer or their non-pulmonary conditions. And so we approach things on a case-by-case -case basis. We evaluate people's symptoms and try and come up with a plan for them. Sometimes that involves time. Sometimes it involves um, further evaluation, medications, but we have to think about other non-medical therapies too. And so I want to give a shout out for pulmonary rehabilitation, which I think is a really important aspect of recovery and survivorship for a lot of our patients. I and mean, we have an excellent um, pulmonary rehabilitation program affiliated with Yale called Lung Life, but there are many around the state and many in other areas as well. Yeah, I mean, I think we're, we're trying to take as little lung as possible. I think the field is moving towards taking as little lung as possible through this, the least traumatic approach as possible. But I, you know, I think the real key is to get to know your patient and what are their goals of care? You know, I had a patient who had a curable lung cancer who it would have kept him from doing one activity that he really liked doing and, and he chose to go a different direction. And so I do think you have to try to really help people and understand what their goals of care are. Along those lines, Tom, one of the chat questions was, what is the difference between SBRT and surgery? I did not plant that question. It, uh, but you had mentioned uh, uh, what SBRT is. Maybe give a, just a couple of uh, more seconds about that. And um, maybe we can just talk about what is the difference about that. for This is treatment for early stage lung cancer. Yeah, so um, SBRT is, again, it's... Um, it's a sort of a specialized version of intensity modulated radiation therapy. So um, as opposed to other types of IMRT, SBRT, the, the radiation oncologist is actually present at the, at the treatment console, every single treatment for the patient, um, which allows us um, to actually uh, reduce the area of lung that we're treating and allows us to increase the dose of radiation to the tumor. Um, and this is a, a big advance that's happened over the last decade or so and has really increased our ability to, um, to, to cure early stage lung cancers. And this was um, getting at Dr. Boffa's question about, um, uh, about surgery versus SBRT. Um, SBRT was actually primarily, um, or patients that were in, uh, treated with SBRT were primarily patients who were um, not able to get surgery. So patients who had lung function that would have precluded them um, from oper operations required to treat their lung cancer. Um, so primarily, we think that SBRT has the advantage of um, having a, a lesser impact on, uh, on lung function than surgery for patients who may have underlying uh, more significant uh, COPD or, or other um, pulmonary uh, comorbidities. Yeah, I, I agree with that. It, the uh, so this is a big debate between surgery and radiation oncologists. Um, I have it right now. We yeah, if you guys can just buckle up here, <laughs> nobody's hungry. Right? The um, so the from from I think there's a trade off. I think that uh, their uh, surgery generally is associated with a longer survival. Uh, that but there are more complications, and there's an investment in a recovery. Um, whereas SBRT, uh, there is generally uh, no recovery and, and minimal complications and, and minimal disruption to your life. And so all my patients with early stage lung cancer, we have a conversation about both treatments and we try to come up with what makes the most sense. Yeah. Eventually, it 
and stated yeah. you were not targeted for it, but you had certainly worked for not to individualize, but to try to generalize for a long time. This is one I knew back in the field, but um, eventually it failed. And when you have to be, you know, versatile with your therapy, which I really appreciate, it's so fun to do that. And I appreciate everybody learn. You start out with one cancer, but eventually it may morph into mm -hmm. something, you know, that you didn't even think you may have had. And more specifically, I'm looking for a definition. Order, yeah. Order, yeah. So that that's a great question, and we have a perfect person to answer that question. We have a pathologist here, <laughs> Dr. Dasik. I'm hoping you can help us with this question. So just to repeat the question while she comes up, um, the question is that to summarize is sometimes lung cancer can change, and so it sounds like in this case maybe it, it started out as a, a disease that was able to be treated with a targeted therapy, and then it changed into something that, as 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 he's saying, is a neurohormonal cancer. And so Dr. Daisy, can you tell us what um, the differences between the types of lung cancer and how sometimes cancers can change? Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. I'm a pathologist. I'm one of those people behind the scene. You never see me and you never hear me. So, but I look at your tissues. So I'm at the first step when the tissue is taken out and I make the diagnosis. And uh, usually the first step is, uh, as we heard, uh, to make a right histological diagnosis. So it's your type of the cancer. It could be glandular one, it could be squamous. We heard a lot about glandulars that have those targets. And uh, we, we make the diagnosis, we send the tissue for the molecular testing, we identify those targets and you get treated. And uh, you do have response through some time and then cancer may come back or it may stop responding. And uh, at that point, we can get another tissue sample and we look at it under the scope and it looks different. It looks completely different than the first time. It's different histological type. And we usually see this transition from adenocarcinoma to small cell carcinoma or old cell carcinoma. Then there are other options. We are going to test it again molecularly. We may find new targets. We can treat again. There is other possible appearance. Uh, it could be like, very ugly looking sarcomatoid carcinoma. Again, we send it for the testing. Again, we can find another target. So they do change. They're like wild animals, you know? They, they are like chameleons. They, they change their look, they change their geno genotype, and, uh, you know, hopefully we can target them and treat them. Yeah, and I think more and more we're, we're, we're getting another biopsy, especially after targeted therapies. Not, they don't always change, but they sometimes do. And so we, we more and more are looking to see if there's been a change and if we can treat it differently because of that. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to move on because we still have a few more talks, believe it or not. Um, a couple of really exciting things. So I don't know why I can't click on the slides anymore. Okay. Sarah, Great. Is yes. The map study still open? Yes. So lung map study is still open. It's changed over the years, right? So there were a set of studies. Scott, you can come up. You're going to go next. Um, there were a set of studies um, within lung map for um, a few years. And then as those studies closed, new ones have opened new targets as the, as the field has evolved and we've learned more new things have come into it. So yes, it's still open. It's different than it was, but it's still going strong. Okay. Next we have Someone many of you probably know, Dr. Scott Gettinger, a medical oncologist, who's going to talk to us about immune therapy and lung cancer. Thanks, Scott. Okay, hey, so let me just figure out how to do this. So nice to see some of you here. Uh, we've been doing this. Who are you not excited to see? <laughs> well, there are certain people. <laughs> um, Anyhow, so, so Dan and, and Sarah asked Justin and I to comment on how immunotherapy has impacted lung cancer, and it certainly has. So we've already heard about <clears throat> some of the traditional therapies that we use to treat our patients with lung cancer. We've heard about surgery. We've heard about radiation. We haven't really heard too much about chemotherapy, uh, but chemotherapy does target rapidly dividing cells, but it does so non-specifically. In the last 20 years, the real advances, at least in advanced stage disease, have been personalizing therapy and then immunotherapy. And Dr. Kim talked to us about how we can use personalized medicine to target characteristics that are unique to a tumor. And the hope there is that we have better therapies with less toxicity. Um, I would venture to say that the biggest advance in the last 
couple decades for lung cancer would be immunotherapy and not just for lung cancer. I think for all cancers, immunotherapy has revolutionized the way we think about and the way we treat uh, cancer. So for, <clears throat> for the immune system to effectively attack um, tumor, there are a couple of things, there are three things, three basic things that need to happen. First, the immune system needs to recognize the tumor um, <clears throat> as foreign, as not self, so it can initiate attack. Second, it needs to recruit forces so it can overcome that tumor. And then finally, once it has its army, it has to be able to penetrate into the tumor and kill it. So <clears throat> tumors have a way of hiding themselves from the immune system. And we have some strategies to try to overcome that. And these are basically vaccine type strategies. So here you can see in the first, uh, first row, we see a tumor that has all these little red and blue things. And these are unique proteins that are expressed by the tumor that the immune system, if they can see these things, they can say, ah, this is not supposed to be there. We can not attack. But again, tumor hides it. So if you radiate this tumor, you kill the tumor and you expose these proteins. So now the immune system can see uh, the cancer and it can actually go to other places now that it's primed and hopefully attack cancer. Another way to do this is we can synthesize these abnormal tumor associated proteins, and then we can inject into the body, making it easier for the immune system to see them. And finally, we can take immune cells out from a patient through the veins, and then we can co-culture them with these synthesized proteins, allowing them to process and, and present these proteins, and then we can inject them back into the, into the body. So here you can see an immune cell that has been vaccinated and has his infrared goggles, and he, he's ready to, um, to expand. And expanding means recruit other members and to um, weaponize yourself. And uh, <clears throat> we can augment this process by adding nonspecific immune stimulators. And these are really the first immunotherapies that were approved for cancer, not for lung cancer, but for melanoma and renal cell carcinoma you might have heard interleukin and interferon. So now you have your army, it's armed and it's ready to go and it gets the tumor, but the tumor can put brakes on the, um, on the immune cells, sort of like a barrier around it. So even though you have this army that recognizes the tumor, it can't get in. And one of the main breaks that the tumor uses, and we use the same breaks to protect ourselves from excessive inflammation and what we call autoimmunity is something called PD-1. And you might've heard of program death ligand one. It's something that we check in your tumors. So the advances, the, the major advance in immunotherapy over the last decade has been targeting this pathway with antibodies, um, either anti-PD-1 or anti pd one antibodies, essentially, um, relieving these breaks and allowing the immune system to, to get into the tumor and to kill tumor. So <clears throat> over the last seven years, we've seen the approval of five different PD-1 blocking drugs and also approval of another drug that blocks a different break called CTLA-4. And um, we have been fortunate enough here at Yale to have run several trials, including the first trial for patients with this drug. And you think about first trials, first in man trials, patients who go onto these trials really have no other options. They've exhausted all standard therapies and their prognosis is on the order of maybe six months. So back in 2009, 2010, we had our first trial, a drug called Opdivo. It wasn't called Opdivo back then, it was called NDX1106. And there are two things that really struck me over the first couple of years of treating patients. First, that these drugs were tolerated incredibly well, much better than chemotherapy, with the majority of patients having little or no side effects. And this was very important because these patients had a prognosis that was poor, and I didn't want to interfere with any quality that they had. And, and I felt good because the first couple of patients, they didn't really have side effects. So then we put 40 patients on the trial. The second observation was that if the tumor responds to immunotherapy, it's going to last much longer than chemotherapy maybe even indefinitely. The first trial that we put patients on, 2010, we, we are still following patients from this trial. In that trial, you had two years of immunotherapy and then you, you had observation. We have patients from that first trial now, 12 years out from starting immunotherapy with a prognosis of six months, 10 years after stopping all therapy with no evidence of cancer. 
So are these patients cured? You know, we don't know, but we hope so. So how do you quantify how immunotherapy has impacted lung cancer? So we heard about five-year survival earlier from Lynn. I don't know, see if Lynn's still here. And we use five-year survival as a surrogate for cure, although it's not the perfect surrogate because there is the rare patient who recurs later than five years. But for our patients who have early stage lung cancer, Dan does a surgery or Justin does a surgery, and we had five years, champagne is open and we say you're cured of your, your lung cancer. So what if we look at advanced lung cancer? And unfortunately, the majority of patients present with either advanced or locally advanced lung cancer. In the past, we would never think of five-year survival, maybe one-year survival, two-year survival. And if you look back in the chemotherapy trials, it was great if we, you know, big milestone was 50% to one-year survival. But if you look at the immunotherapy trials, we see five-year survivals on the order of 15 to 20%. Unheard of. Are these patients cured? We don't know. You know, there's not enough time. But I can tell you from the patients that I've treated, if I don't see the disease progressing after about three years, almost all of them continue to have no evidence of disease now five, six, seven years later. So are these patients cured? The problem that we have is that immunotherapy really only helps 15 to 20% of patients with advanced lung cancer. And, um, and so that leaves a lot of patients. And so at Yale, we're conducting several different clinical trials to try to find other parts of the immune system that we can wake up to fight cancer. And I think over the next years, we'll see many more immunotherapies and that 15 to 20% will go up steadily year by year. So Justin, it looks like you're next. Thanks, Scott. It's Justin Blasberg. Uh, again, I'm a, one of the thoracic surgeons. Uh, thanks to this group for having uh, me talk to you about um, early stage lung cancer, surgical lung cancer, and the role of immunotherapy, which is a really exciting space for uh, all of us. Um, as you can see from this uh, figure, there, and as we've discussed a few times tonight, there are a number of different ways of treating lung cancer. I'm a thoracic surgeon, so surgery is part of my day-to-day -day chemotherapy, radiation. We've sort of talked about these different options. Um, and, you know, I think over the past decade, the real advancements, the really exciting stuff, as Scott alluded to, is looking at how these tumors work genetically, whether lung cancers have genetic mutations. And these are opportunities for us to think about treating patients well beyond the surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation um, sort of arms here. Uh, this includes, uh, you know, targeting specific mutations, but also immunotherapy, which Scott touched on a, a little bit, tr how we trigger our immune system to fight cancer. It's usually by stimulating or boosting our innate immune system so they can work, work harder and the immune system could work uh, smarter uh, to attack cancer cells. So, you know, although immunotherapy was, as discussed, studied mostly in advanced disease, I think there are now opportunities at Yale for us to incorporate this kind of uh, treatment into earlier stage patients, patients who are candidates for surgery. So we can consider immunotherapy prior to surgery, potentially to redu reduce the risk of disease spreading, to think about reducing the stage of, of disease, and ultimately to improve the outcome for our patients. We know immunotherapy is really well tolerated in our surgery patients. Uh, in a clinical trial that we conducted here at Yale, uh, we identified that these treatments don't delay surgery, they don't impact how we do the surgery, and that patients respond to those treatments in a very favorable way. So we've been uh, fortunate to be a part of immunotherapy trials, uh, including other cancer centers across the country. Um, you know, we recently finished enrolling patients in a study and the sort of the outline of that study is a uh, screen right here. But basically what that means is patients would come in, get two treatments of their immunotherapy. They'd go on to have surgery and then after surgery, the opportunity to have immunotherapy for an additional 12 months. We learned a lot from this trial. We were uh, enrolled a number of patients in this trial uh, uh, and a lot of patients across the country. You know, we had, we had a really nice uh, representation of Yale patients in this trial. And, and we learned a lot, as I said, we learned that immunotherapy is safe in the setting. It's an exciting opportunity for our patients. Uh, tumors respond to immunotherapy uh, in our surgical population. And we think this represents uh, an exciting time and an exciting opportunity for uh, patients who are in our lung cancer program. I'm going to be brief because I know we're short on time. Do you have any questions? Probably for Scott. 
Yep, maybe we'll take one question and then we'll move on to our last speaker. Anybody have any questions? Okay. All right, let, let's hear from, thank you so much, Justin. Let's hear from our last speaker. So, and then we can probably stay a couple minutes extra and, and answer questions for these last couple of talks at the end. Great. So Dr. Wilson is gonna talk to us about new treatments on the horizon. You've kind of heard about where we are today, where the kind of the current state of the art treatment and management of lung cancer. Now we're gonna hear about new treatments on the horizon. Thanks so much. Great, thanks, Sarah. You know, so one of the really exciting things uh, for us in terms of being able to work in the field of lung cancer is that we often get the opportunity to see new treatments uh, being developed uh, and introduced uh, into clinical care. One of the recent uh, really exciting breakthroughs in lung cancer has been the development of new targeted treatments uh, for a specific gene alteration in a gene called KRAS. Now, we've known for decades uh, that KRAS is an important target, not only in lung cancer, but in other cancers as well. But for decades, we've never had any good targeted treatments against KRAS. But that's now changed in the last couple of years with the development of new treatments for a specific alteration in KRAS known as KRAS G12C. We see this KRAS G12C alteration in about 12% uh, of lung adenocarcinomas, which is the most common subtype of lung cancer. Uh, and importantly, just last year, uh, the FDA approved one of these targeted KRAS G12C treatments, uh, a drug called sotoracid, for patients with lung cancer. And so currently right now, uh, research is going on both here at Yale and elsewhere with clinical trials uh, looking at uh, sotoracid in combination uh, with other uh, treatments in lung cancer, which could include chemotherapy or immunotherapy or any of uh, the agents uh, shown in the uh, diagram on the right there. And so the goal is really to see if we can uh, uh, cause even uh, better outcomes uh, for our patients uh, when treated with the KRAS G12C inhibitor in combination uh, with other uh, treatments. And importantly, uh, additional uh, new uh, treatments uh, targeting KRAS are also in development and are starting to enter uh, clinical uh, study as well. So clinical trials like this are exciting because they offer an opportunity uh, to bring uh, cutting edge new treatments to patients while also providing researchers with an opportunity to learn from our patients uh, who are treated uh, on clinical studies. One of the things that we're always uh, looking for are opportunities to bring some of the exciting uh, scientific discoveries that are made in research laboratories at Yale into the clinic for the benefit of our patients. So we've heard already uh, tonight from Dr. Gettinger that immunotherapies have really transformed uh, lung cancer care. But he also told us that these therapies don't work for everyone. Uh, and so uh, a really important uh, area of research investigation is trying to develop uh, strategies to get immunotherapies to work better and for more patients. And so we're fortunate uh, here at Yale to have uh, a new uh, clinical trial uh, developed uh, by Dr. Goldberg and colleagues, uh, which uh, combines immunotherapy uh, with uh, a drug called pembrolizumab together uh, with an experimental targeted therapy called uh, citrovatinib. And part of the, the rationale for this clinical trial uh, was based on uh, laboratory work done by investigators uh, here at Yale that showed that a citrovatinib appears to be able to modify the environment around the tumor to make it more conducive to immunotherapy. And so one of the goals of this trial uh, is to uh, determine if immunotherapy might work for more people if it's given uh, together uh, with citrovatinib. So we're excited to have this as a new potential treatment option for eligible patients with advanced uh, non-small cell lung cancer who are interested in receiving their lung cancer care as part of a clinical study. And while uh, clinical trials like this, as we've heard uh, uh, on, on multiple times tonight, uh, represent an important uh, component of the research enterprise here at Yale, there are actually other opportunities for us to learn uh, from our patients at, at Yale through research as well. 
So uh, we're very fortunate here that many of our patients uh, provide permission for us to use some of their um, tumor material for research studies. They could be studies to help us to try to understand factors that contribute to lung cancer growth and development, or opportunities to look for new potential treatments. And so uh, we recently uh, found uh, a new potential target that was actually identified from a lung cancer of a research study participant uh, here at Yale. Uh, what we found is shown there in the upper right. Uh, we found that there was um, an alteration in this patient's tumor that uh, abnormally brought together and joined two separate genes, which gives rise to what we call a gene fusion. And this sort of caught our attention because we know that gene fusions like this are important in contributing to the development uh, of certain lung cancers. Um, and so uh, when we, we can then sort of take that uh, potential target and now introduce it into cell models, which allows us an opportunity to study the potential target and to ask questions like, what does the new target do and where is it located? So if you look at the bottom on the far right there, with this particular gene fusion, what we saw when we put it into cells is that it actually goes to the plasma membrane. So that surrounds and outlines the cell. You can see that with that green uh, circular rim there. But just below that, with a slightly different version uh, of the target, uh, you can see that its localization completely changes. And now it's located throughout the inside of the cell. So insights like this are important because they help us understand what um, a potential target might be doing in the cell. And we can also use these models um, to be able to test uh, different uh, treatment strategies to try to find ones that might be able to work against the target. So um, you know, research like this is really only possible uh, with the participation uh, of uh, our patients here at Yale. And so, you know, we're always um, excited by the opportunity and privilege to be able to partner with our patients to help us to try to better understand um, how lung cancers can develop uh, and to hopefully better develop uh, better uh, treatments for patients. So I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Rick. That's so cool. I love those pictures. Um, well, we are past the hour. So many amazing questions and discussions and talks that we went past our time. Um, I, I will just leave the floor open for questions for another few minutes if people want to stay or if you need to go, we understand. Any last questions, anything in the chat, Dan? We need to address? Nothing in the chat. Okay. Thank you all, all right. for coming. Yes. Really and thank you uh, for participating in research for those that have, and thank you for letting us care for you. If that's been the case and uh we're always available for questions and always available to look after anybody that uh that's interested in having us be involved dr herbst did you want to say something i see you on on your video still no well i okay. i watching here by video uh, i'm very there. proud and honored to be part of this team i think um the the key to the best care is innovation but also a multimodality approach and I think what we've seen tonight is that we really need to combine surgery, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, pulmonology, uh, supportive care, uh, all together with the best molecular diagnosis, the best drugs uh, to try to you know, really push progress forward. And, and it's great to see so many people in the audience. I wish I was there tonight. I'm actually at a conference in Washington uh, you know, designing new clinical trials. Um, but um, thank you, Sarah. And and Dan for a wonderful moderating. And thank you to all of our speakers and also to Rene Gaudet and, and Nelson Dagata for all their work on this. Yes, I second that. Thank you to everyone, to all of our speakers and participants. I think people will probably stick around for another minute or two if anybody has questions and wants to come up to the front. Thank you all so much again for joining in person and virtually and uh, see you next year 50, or maybe next week. 15, 50 and 15. <laughs> okay.